So this section is called African Women's Bodies in the American Theater. Our moderator for this session is Lois Roach, a senior lecturer in theater studies department at Wellesley College. Ms. Roach is a writer, Emmy Award winning producer and stage director. She is currently working on not one, not two, but three screenplays based in Boston. She has been selected as one of Boston's 100 most influential people of color. And since 2009, Company One Theater has presented the Lois Roach Theater Community Award to individuals every year in recognition of their outstanding commitment to the Boston area theater community. Her play, Living On, is under agreement with Samuel French and has been performed around the country. She has been a visiting artist and now a senior lecturer in the theater studies department at Wellesley College for over 25 years. So it is my great pleasure to welcome our moderator, uh, senior lecturer, Lois P. Roach. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. Now this is a theater panel, so I must hear you. Good afternoon. For those of you all in the back, please come forward. We got front row seats here. Please come forward, move forward so we see. We theater people, we like to see our audiences. Yes? Come forward. It is my pleasure to be on this stage with Amfaniso Udafia. She is a first generation Nigerian American storyteller actress, playwright, and educator. And like most people in the theater, she's got more than one job. That's how we survive. We keep five jobs. Um, a 2006 graduate of Wellesley College. Oh, that was weak, people. A 2006 graduate of Wellesley College. That means she did it. She graduated, yes. Emphaniso <laughs> was a force on this campus with her performances in Let Me Speak. How many know Let Me Speak? Yes? Okay, let's keep going. But her activism with Ethos and her return for a staged reading of her play in old age. Emphaniso is currently under deadline with no less than five theatrical commissions, five theatrical commissions, and three upcoming stage productions. Her Ufat cycle play, Her Poor Manteau, will be produced this spring by Pasadena's Boston Court Performing Arts Center. Her plays have recently been produced by the New York Theater Workshop, the Magic Theater, and the Playwrights Realm. Umfaniso is currently in rehearsal for a reading of her play, Adia and Clora Snatch Joy. I love that title. <laughs> and that's at the Manhattan Theater Club. She's the recipient of the 2017 Helen Merrill Playwright Award and the 2017-2018 McKnight National Residency and Commission at the Playwrights Center in Minneapolis. In my world, we call this a national artist. And Feniso is currently translating Othello for the Oregon Shakespeare Festival's Play On program. And she is the founding artistic director of the Now Africa Playwrights Festival and a proud member of New Dramatist Class of 2023. Welcome home with another big round of applause, Emphaniso Udafia. Thank you so much, Lois, for that introduction. Uh, Lois was one of the professors here that helped nurture my love of the theater. And I am so excited and truly honored to return to Wellesley to give this small talk and then to sit down with her and then with you for a conversation. So before we delve further into who I am, and I think Lois just gave a surround sound. 
<laughs> picture of who I am, <laughs> or at least what my art is. I want to define my field of work. It's not a field that many associate with Wellesley women, and it's not a field that many inherently associate with African women. And I am both. Along with being many, many, many other things, I am both a first-generation Nigerian-American woman and a Wellesley woman. So, theater, performance arts, me. Here's a little that I didn't tell Lois that I will now tell you. I have, over the course of my life, played ensemble and jazz trombone. I have trained as an opera singer, lyric soprano. I received my MFA as an actress from the Tony-nominated American Conservatory Theater, and I currently make most of my bread and butter as a playwright and educator. My teaching focusing either on teaching the arts, playwriting, the practicum side, playwriting or acting, or teaching schools of thought. I specifically teach non-Western global dramatic history at the New School of Performing Arts. But my passion resides solidly within playwriting and education. Theater. Theater, according to uh, Miriam Webster, is a building or area for dramatic performances. It is an outdoor structure for dramatic performance or spectacle in ancient Greece, Rome. It is a place or sphere of ena enactment of usually significant events or action. I looked that up when I was young, like in Lois's class, and I was like, uh, something about that definition, though, is a little off for me. It's clinical. It's a little limiting. And then I found this list. So let's take it further beyond the definition and consider why I would choose this as my profession. Dr. Kevin Brown, an assistant professor with the Department of Theater at the University of Missouri Columbia, wrote a short list on why theater is important for the Theater Communications Group website. His list comprises 10 major reasons. I will distill and paraphrase his list, which you can find in its entirety online. Theater is important because human beings. Theater is a universal cultural phenomenon that exists in every society around the world. Human beings are the only animal species that we know of, because as of now, we don't know the minds of elephants or what they're doing, but it is human. It's only humans that practice theater. Self-expression. Theater develops our ability to communicate our thoughts and feelings to others, thus potentially improving relationships in the world around us. Self-knowledge. Theater teaches us about ourselves. Through the life of a character on stage, we can find and understand our own mind. History. Theater can make history come alive before our eyes so that we can live within a specified history and know the importance of the world that just preceded us. The body. Theater can be and is a constant reminder in this digital age that the human body is the center of every single societal transaction. Globalization. Theater can help us to understand people from cultures other than our own. Theater can lead us to become more accepting of others. Self-empowerment. Relationships are constructed around performances. Um, what, a, what do I mean by a performance? Here's an example. Uh, this speech right now is a performance. The way you behave with your mother is a performance. When you wake up and you walk and you talk, some would call that your performance of self. Understanding how performance works through viewing theater can help us recognize and take control of relationships and afford us the ability to shift the power dynamics that can sometimes control and affect us. Social change. Theater is a cultural space where society examines itself in the mirror. Theater can ask, what, can, what change can occur if a society were to look unflinchingly at itself? Education. Learning through theater can be a great way to transfer knowledge and potentially in a non-hierarchical way. And lastly, creativity. As we increase and put our emphasis on science, tech, engineering, and math, creativity can be the way in which we retain the human. And creativity is one of the currencies, if not the most powerful currency of the theater. 
Now that, all of that that I just listed is why I do this work. That is why I am now a theater pr practitioner. That list comprises a bit of what I felt at Wellesley in Lois Roach's and Diego Arseniega's class. It took me a while to understand in myself why, why theater was so important to me. And this list is a great distilling rubric. So to say it in my own words, this field that I chose to work within is an inherently human field. It is a field concerned with exposing and excavating and examining all of the nuances of the human condition. Then putting that on display so that we can potentially learn ourselves and maybe even one another. Theater for me renders humanities, my humanity, visible. Now, <laughs> let's entertain the problem that I encountered within the theater, specifically the American theater. Like I said earlier, although I work throughout theater in many capacities, my bread and butter and my passion as well, which is so lovely that I can link that all up, is in writing and education. I, however, want to focus on only one of those passions for now, playwriting. I would like all of you to take five seconds. I will actually silently count to five, so only do this on my go. And I would like you to name to yourselves as many playwrights as you can silently. Go. Was that hard? Mm -hmm. Now I want you to remember that I just said theater is important and why it was. Now, here's another five seconds of time you're about to get. Please name as many African playwrights as you can. Go. Was that hard? Again, I want you to remember that I just listed all the ways theater is so important. Now, name as many African women playwrights as you can. Five seconds, and you may count me. You just met me. You might not know all my work, but you may count me. Go. Was that hard? Remember that Dr. Kevin Brown said that theater was important because, and I'll say it again, because drill is part of what we theater people do, self-knowledge. Theater teaches us about ourselves. Through the life of a character on stage, we find and understand our own mind. History, theater can make history come alive before our eyes so that we can live within and know the importance of the worlds that preceded our own. Globalization, theater can help us understand people from cultures other than our own, and thus making us more accepting of what we don't know. Social change, theater is a cultural space where society examines itself in a mirror. So what does it mean then if we are to extrapolate from that short, completely unscientific exercise we just did? That A, we probably don't know and or watch enough theater in the first place. B, we aren't seeing enough African theater, not in America anyway, and there are major African populations within the states, so what does this missing mean? And then C, the visibility of African women playwrights before the past few years on the American stage has been almost no. Maybe so invisible to our eyes that naming them feels impossible. Not counting the last few years, of course. In 2009, after my graduations from both Wellesley in 2006 and the American Conservatory Theater 2009, I was perhaps in the position I just put you all in. I could name a few plays and I truly could not find, however, representations of myself within the theater, not many. All that was different between you and I potentially was that I knew that theater was a career for me. So I found myself asking what it meant that the American theater, theater which is supposed to be representational of the society at large, did not seem to include images of me. What was the American theater reflecting back to me about American society and my place within it? Uh, before I continue, let me give you a little information about me some more. I grew up in Southridge, Massachusetts. I am uh, one of the children born to two formidable academics. I went to school from 7 a.m. to 2 to 3 p.m. every weekday and came back home after extracurriculars and was trained by my parents. <laughs> 
My father would uh, hand me books after the school day was over and tell me to come up with abstracts and papers on said books. We would debate France Fanon and Du Bois when I was 13. Now, I am not sure the 13-year-old me understood much of anything, but my father would ensure I could think and hold my own in an argument. My mother further instilled in me a love of reading. She would come home with plastic bags full of books, put them in front of me, and gently, because her way is more gentle, encourage me to read. <laughs> I was studying for the SAT at an obscenely young age. There was an actual premium on my brain. I came to Wellesley thinking that I would serve as an agent of change in the form of a lawyer, politician, diplomat. I came to Wellesley and y'all, I, I almost lost my mind. <laughs> because while the brain is glorious, my heart space, human space, was also large and I needed to figure out how to feed that too. And while I was very happy at home debating because I was centered within home, at Wellesley I was floundering. To the point, and my mother is gonna die with me saying this out loud, I even failed a course here. I took six classes in a semester. <laughs> I, it, that's insane. <laughs> a dean saw me. She took me into her office, asked me what I did for joy. I shook my head, said I didn't know, and she said, well, make sure you don't lose your grants to be here, and if you want to be a lawyer after this, fine. Okay, I don't think that's for you, but okay, we will help you. But while you are at Wellesley, from now on, you will, one, go to the Stone Center, three, take no more than four classes in a semester, and three, your extracurriculars will bring you joy. That's when I discovered opera, and both my brain and my mind were evenly used, and then from there came the theater, and that balance was truly right for me. That history is what I carried when I landed in 2009 in New York City. I was trying to make a go of being a theater maker because I was open and feeling, and I just knew, and, and, and there was nothing, nothing around me in the theater landscape, the working theater landscape that looked and felt like me, so I had to create. That last rung on Dr. Brown's list, that list as to what makes theater important, was creativity. Creativity, creativity is one of the currencies of theater. So, without knowing his list in 2009, that list that I just shared with you, I followed my feeling and I used the currency I could only esoterically talk about. I created. I actually embarked on a dual creation. I would create the art itself, in my world, the play, the art that I wanted to see viewed by audiences, and I would also create a space for myself within the American theater. Done, okay, I set sail, I wrote a play, <laughs> The Grove. That play became a trilogy, Sojourners, The Grove, Run Boy Run, then a pentology, Sojourners, The Grove, Run Boy Run, Her, Point, Her Portmanteau, and In Old Age, and then finally, a nine play cycle, with a, and it's a word I struggle to say, Enneology, I think I just said it. Uh, and that is gonna be comprised of Sojourners, The Grove, Run Boy Run, Her Portmanteau, In Old Age, untitled, because it's not yet written, untitled, because it's not yet written, untitled, because it's not yet written, and then Adia and Clora, Snatch Joy, the first draft of which I just finished some weeks ago. I set out to write this nine play cycle on Nigerians in America. I would, am, chronicling their lives from 1978 until until into future years that I cannot yet see. I was, am writing in order to add to the theater canon plays that can be performed first on American stages and then hopefully the world over. These plays cover issues around African identity in America, African mental health crises, African sexuality expressions, African romantic love, the linking and yoking of the African body to its kindred spirit, the African American body, and more, more, more. I wanted to do this because I wanted to see myself. Because myself and bodies like mine, African bodies, first generation bodies, etc., exist within the society I know. We are here. And if everyone practices theater, why not see myself? I wrote. Then I started creating the inroads into theater community, space. I searched for and worked with African actresses and actors, and we trained each other up. Only I'm going to list the names of some of these people because they're important. 
Onye Mechi Aharanwa, Eli Fumbi, Ibi Bassi, Isosa Edom Swan, Ngozi Anyangu, Shegu Nakanda, Chenasa Agbuagu, Chenaza Uche, Adapero Oduye, and on and on and on. These are just some of the African actors in my world work. And together, we honored the place we came from. We rehearsed in homes and community centers and non-theatrical places of work. We did that before institutions cared and or became involved. Because sometimes it takes an institution a long time to invite you in. And the work is important anyway. So we did it. Then, as institutions became involved, I struggled to bring these African bodies into and inside the institutions. <laughs> and I had to become strong in the fight to bring the body along with me. In the beginning, I admit I failed. Sometimes I failed badly. But then a realization came. For my work to sing, for the work to sing, I could not be divorced from the authentic body. And then more creation, because creation begets creation, and that is theater. Now Africa was born. Around 2014, I began wondering why I was operating as if I was the only African woman who was writing and who had ever written before. Common sense told me that it had to be untrue, and just because I did not see it didn't mean it didn't exist. I needed to find out my African writer's history legacy, expose it, and continue to create space in the theater for us, of, in the theater, for theater to do what theater also wants to do, situate us within histories. So we can now know the worlds that precede us. Hence the creation of Now Africa. Now Africa is a company I founded that is comprised of myself, Erin Cherry, executive director, and Gazi Anyanwu, associate, artistic associate, and casting maven, Chinyere Anyanwu, and together we ex excavated African theatrical history. We researched the classics that are not taught, and I gave myself names. Walisho Yinka, Femi Uba, Ngugi Watsiongo, Tafik Al Hakim, Yusef Al Gindi, Ola Rotimi. Those are names that I should have known but did not know until I did research. Then I learned of John Connie, Bernard Binlindarie, Joe de Graft, Workshop 71, John Ruganda, and Adamello Bello. And then all of a sudden, the women, the African women playwrights, started appearing. Ama Ata Aidu, Jalila Bakar, Violet Barungi, Reza Dewet, Natalie Etoke. I read them in joy. And now Africa put some of these artists' work on stage and invited the New York community and any community that wanted to come out and see, to see. We dropped them into histories they should have always known. That's theater. The theater today is finally starting to do for me what the theater was meant to do. Be a dynamic mirror. The kind where you can see yourself and afford yourself and others the opportunity for change because of that sight. And as creation begets creation and creation is not linear, I looked up from all the work I'd been doing and it hit me, 2017, and it really hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, it had been hitting me a little bit, but it hit me like hard, hard. <laughs> uh, that others have been working as hard as I have to create space within the theater other African women. I looked up and I saw contemporary playwright who writes plays on African memory, American reality, and human imagining, Ngozi Anyangu. Contemporary playwright Jocelyn Bio, who daringly writes African comedic plays because Africans laugh. Deborah Asimwe, whose work is clean and sharp as she writes on immigration lines and hoping and dreaming. And Auntie Yakub, Kamiondo Kutuno, and uh, Adong, Ju Joseph, uh, Adong Judith. And there is so much joy in all these names. And there are so many. And may there be more and more creation. I look around me and must acknowledge that there's a movement afoot. Who knows when, how it began, but it started with creation, the currency of theater. I looked and saw that there was something missing and I created it and all of these artists have been doing the same and now it's not so difficult to see us anymore. Not as difficult as it was for me in 2009 and hopefully that exercise we did in the beginning makes it easier and easier for people outside to name every year that passes more and more of us. 
I can now say that I was able to see a play before it moved to Broadway, eclipsed my Zimbabwean play, uh, by, by Zimbabwean playwright Denai Guira, featuring Mexican Kenyan actress Lupita Nyongo, directed by South African woman director Liesl Tommy. May more come. I am proud to be within this movement. And I know this is Wellesley, this is a MasterCard event. Many of you are not heading into the theater performance entertainment as your chosen profession, so you might be wondering how does this apply to me? One of the most salient points on Dr. Kevin Brown's list was creativity. Creativity as we are increasingly putting our emphasis on science, tech, energy, engineering, and math. Creativity can be the way in which we retain the human. And creativity is one of the currencies of theater. And that creativity leads to all the other booms on that list. And that creativity is not theater exclusive. It's just daring, some fortitude of spirit, a desire to see what can become when it feels like there is nothing there. That is a currency that applies everywhere. And if you remember that and consider the way in which creation begets creation, perhaps you too can harness some of the powerful gifts of theater to create movement within your respective field. Lois, let's talk a little. I must smile, thank you. <laughs> My first question is such. Um, in the commercial realm, we travel from the world of the Lion King. How many of you know of the Lion King? Show of hands. Mm-hmm. To the world of Black Panther. Oh, ooh. <laughs> we got some cheers behind Black Panther. Wakanda forever. <laughs> All right. So with this, one of the things I am curious to talk about is who gets to tell what story and what are your observations? 2009, when I came out, Lion King was one of the shows that was running that um, seemed to hold Africanness somewhere. And it was problematic for me because yes, the bodies are anthropomorphized. So it's like you're looking at Africans in the body of animal and other, other Disney stories don't do that. Uh, it's also based on Hamlet, which is not potentially uh, rooted in an African lore. And then I used to play this game when I was teaching going, where in Africa is Pride Rock? when you start looking at the species of animal that are featured and you're like, oh Lord, is it Kenya? Is it South Africa? Are we on the West? Because Rafiki doesn't exist anywhere but this particular place on the West. <laughs> so it's, um, it is, it was, it's problematic. And I do wonder uh, what gaze is in there as we are looking at Africa as this monolithic place and some ideation of Africa. And so I had a problem with it. However, I am really interested in what I think Black Panther is attempting to do, which I think is critically different. In that um, Black Panther, we're looking at imagined Africans, Africas without whiteness in the center. It is hard to do. There are so many complications within that. But you're looking at black imagining, African imagining, and it's refreshing. They are using bodies and storylines that are rooted in um, actual histories and on purpose are folding them together. And all the think pieces are talking about the purposefulness with which they're looking at Africa. That is new. And it is done by black bodies. And that sometimes is everything. Okay. Um, can you make art and still make money? <laughs> yeah, I do that too. <laughs> uh, it's hard. It's hard. And I think that anybody who is entering this business and goes, I am a creator. If money is the first thing that feeds you, 
Stop. Uh, will it come? Potentially. But something else had better taste better to you than money? Because that's always in the realm of potential. The first three, four years of my career, I worked for free. I did not sleep. I was writing plays at night while juggling two part-time jobs to make them a full-time job because it's 2009, it's the middle of the recession. Things were rough. So I've never been chasing money. What I wanted to see was uh, if my plays could gain traction and Africans could start coming to the theater and go, I see myself. That was what was important for me. I tell my students, you only do this work if it helps you breathe. Mm -hmm. Because nobody in their right mind does this work. Not really, no. No. <laughs> it must feed you in the same way that air feeds you. Mm -hmm. Especially in those moments where, because nobody gets up in the morning and says, guess what? I'm going to write something and hope it gets reviewed and rejected. Nobody in their right mind does that. Mm -hmm. But we do it because this is how we breathe. Mm -hmm. And we need air to breathe, and this is our air. I've got one more question, and then I must open it up to the peoples. Yeah. Um, this past Sunday, just this past Sunday, we watched um, Frances McDormand explode the Oscars with two words, inclusive writer. When I was talking with Enfaniso, I said, you know, I've been doing this work a very long time. And I've never heard that phrase, inclusive writer. Oh, I know what it means. I've been doing this work a very long time. I know what it means. Um, but it was powerful for me to hear it and have that moment. So how has the theater, or has the theater, been in front of this practice in your observation? I'm going to talk about it from what I know, know. Um, and that's going to be within the world of my work. And I kind of touched on it a little bit in, um, in, in the, the talk just now. I don't subscribe to a scarcity politic, which just says there's just one of us, one African woman, one African story. We are one and done. I'm going to like hold this position and nobody else lives there with me. That, to me, is not how... Uh, a moment becomes a movement. Mm. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. And so I have to, in myself, disrupt the thought continually. And it is not easy because everything in our world feels like it is based on a scarcity politic. I have to disrupt in myself the need to hold on to my position as if I am the only one that belongs there. So at least in the world of what I'm talking, uh, what I just talked about with the African playwrights, we are friends. I just finished a show by a Siskin friend in Gaziantep, where I was acting again in her show. I will call her to act in mine. I, I, I say her name as many times as I say my own sometimes. I say Jocelyn's name. I have not yet met Denai, but I say her name. It is important. And that's the way it's happening right now in my work. Mm -hmm. We are traveling as a pack, and we will just pick you up, and we will keep moving. There you go. Any questions from our audience, please? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Barbara. For I guess for you, because I've already introduced myself. Uh, Barbara Nasila uh, from UC Berkeley. I'm a Kenyan. And I guess I have a very, first of all, I'm very inspired by your story. Um, I've, I read up on you, listened to you talk before, I think in Wellesley. <laughs> and your story and Chimamanda's story, they both um, really make me think about what it means to write in this modern age as an African woman, as basically writing as, as well in a diaspora and just kind of setting. And I'm curious about some of the things you actually asked about in terms of the Black, Lion King and the Black Panther, and what you talked about, um, the idea of the monolithic story of Africa. And, that's actually, um, basically, I loved Black Panther. <laughs> I have to say I loved it. And um, there was so much realness and so much um, accuracy in how they, they depicted some of the African cultures. But the thing is, um, they depicted it as Africa. <laughs> and um, as I watched it with my fellow black uh, friends, 
I realized none of them could actually tell that there was a difference in the different aspects of um, the different cultures. Like, they couldn't tell that the accents were different. They couldn't tell that the clothes were different and they weren't from the exact same place. And I was curious if you, if you, what you thought about that and how you felt, if that's going to affect the future of how we view um, Africa, how um, the Western world views Africa. And I was also curious about... Um, so Lion King and Black Panther, both, unfortunately, um, seem to be written by Caucasian or like Western uh, writers. I think Leon King, uh, Black Panther, the first comic strip was written by two middle-aged white men. <laughs> but the movie was not. The movie definitely was not. And even continuing that, um, Tahenisi quotes, quotes, yeah, took over the writing of Black Panther. And he's, they're amazing. So I, I was curious how you felt, like how that shaped, how um, African stories are somewhat sometimes written and um, narrated by um, Western minds and Western, uh, basically, writers. Like, if you look at some history books, they're written by uh, Europeans and stuff. How we feel like that affects uh, the version of Africa that's represented out there. And finally, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Wait, but I just, just one question. <laughs> that's basically, I just leave it at that. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you think about that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, only, only, only because I, I got to keep all the questions in my head, <laughs> too. So um, for the first question, what I felt about all of the different Africas you were seeing that sometimes even with our kin who are like African-American, you, you can't decipher the different Africas. Uh, it, is, it is a problem that I also ran into. I'm not going to lie or shy away from that. However, there was a beautiful moment that I want to describe. I went and I saw um, the movie with one of my deepest soul kin friends who happens to be from the American South and might not have known all of the things that I knew. And it was myself afterwards who was like, did you see this and this and this and this? And I know that we get exhausted, like an educational fatigue, but this is our kin. And this is a movie that is attempting to be for us, written by at least the, the screen version of it, by a person of color for us. So there's complicated thinking within the piece, because I mean, we could get into who Killmonger is and why we need to start unpacking that, oh. you know? So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of thinking, but it, I think that it's thinking that is supposed to be done in conversation between our bodies. And so is it complicated? Yes. If we don't talk about it, do we run the risk of rotating ourselves into another weird version of a Lion King moment if we're not careful? Yes. Is there a way in which we can now, because this movie exists, start talking because it was made for us? Yes. So I went through and was like, look at this, look at this, look at our hair, look at the way they're dancing. Do you see those marks? That's different. And my friend was like, oh, I did not know that. I did not know that. I did not know that. And then we had a conversation about Killmonger and the pain of Killmonger. And I think that that is the point of the movie. For your second question as to what you do when you see a lot of our stories not written for us, I mean, uh, written by people, bodies that are, are us. Um, for that question, I go, I never want to restrict an artist's ability to tell a story. But I was talking to Lois about this, about I, I view privilege as blindness. That's the way I talk about it when I teach. And I get, I think that if you are, and I'm just going to say it out and we'll see the controversies that come back to me. But if you are a white body writing blackness, there is so much privilege that must be dismantled in order to write a nuanced body. And the ability to say, I don't know, which is sometimes something an artist doesn't want to say, a human being doesn't want to say, is something that you must embrace. And until that kind of work is done, I do get a little, <clears throat> from where are you writing, why are you writing, and how? 
I will say that refreshingly, I have met some that are doing that dismantling work. And what is happening is that sometimes they're writing and they create space for bodies that are not their body to be heard. So while I go, yes, it can be done, I think that the work triples. And once you embark on the work, the way in which you approach the writing of those bodies changes and who you invite in the room is categorically different. Yes. Hi, my name is Aisha. I'm from Michigan State University and I'm from Nigeria. Um, my question would be, um, just for lack of representation here in the United States, what would you say about um, African playwriters in Africa that are not accredited and not recognized and their work is considered useless? Um, how, what is the best way to approach it in a way that um, these people are recognized for their work and they're supported? Just the way um, the Lion King playwright goes internationally everywhere, how can we have our own playwriters and their work shown everywhere and their play done in different countries around the world? There are movements right now that are trying to address the issue that you are talking about, which is a, a real one. I know I'm gonna talk a little bit about Now Africa that tries to reach across borders in order to start exposing, because uh, I think American theater is extraordinarily um, narrow. We don't, talking about black bodies, we don't do anything that is not American theatrically with joy. <laughs> <laughs> That's not where we live. So now Africa tries to do some of that work and reach across borders and be like, who are the Africans that are writing in Africa that we need to know of and can we provide a platform so that people can see and hear of them? And not as importantly though, as some of the work that's happening on the ground that I've been seeing and it is um, like um, Aroji, Rogers Otieno in Kenya attempting to really start to build a national conversation on what Kenyan theater is and localizing it. These movements are happening. Uh, what you're talking about in like, how do we love and hold our own? Those are some of the things that I think he is fighting right now in, in, in building. Um, and he has attached to everything like from Sundance on in order to like build and then sometimes shirking that, going, no, I build on my own. It is, it is not easy. I don't quite know how to answer this question with ease. All I know is that I know that there are people on the ground attempting to tackle this question that you're asking right now. Um, and a lot of what I'm seeing Oroji do is try to harness what the love of Kenyan everything is first, to then hold a Kenyan theater to show that back to Kenya. I don't know if that answers, doing my best, so yeah. I see one here, and then I, I got a one minute song, so. Ah. Hey, I'm Jen Fry with Duke. I kind of have two baby questions. One, can you explain what Inclusion Rider is? Because I'm not sure if many people know if it differs between TV and theater. Mm -hmm. And second, do you think that the writers and producers and everyone of Black Panther kind of have an obligation to bring forth some of the African writers, producers, since in a way they're using that to get American notoriety. Say that last part again so that I really, because I want to make sure I understand. Do you think that the writers, producers of Black Panther have kind of an obligation to the continent of Africa to bring forth some of those directors, producers, actors with them because they're kind of riding on the coattails of Africa mm -hmm. to bring forth the play. Mm -hmm. so I'll take inclusion the first one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so what an inclusion writer states is that if you as an actor, as a star, as a director, in order for you to become attached to a project, and this is primarily film, but for you to be attached to a project, you want to make sure that 50% of the cast and crew are of a diverse audience, are of a diverse cast and crew. That's the goal of it. The reason why we had this conversation around theater is that for some of us who've been doing theater forever, we do that anyway. 
So I'm always, since I live in multiple worlds of television, theater, and film, it's always interesting to me to see how far in advance theater is. Because we don't need a lot for theater. We can make something happen right now. We can shut this door and give me an hour. We got a show. That's how we work. I'll let you take the second one and then I'll respond to that. Mm -hmm. My answer is yes, I do think that there needs to be um, a bringing and acknowledging of the stories that you are taking and using and fusing to make this beautiful attempt at a conversation. That is important. Uh, and I am not as well versed on this, but I think I have been seeing some things where people are unhappy that some, some things might not have been attributed to where they belong. And that is an issue. And so I say, yes, yeah, it's going to be very important. And I know it's Black Panther. They have done one already. There's probably two more coming. It is important and it's going to be very telling to watch what is happening in those rooms and the way in which they are holding the art. This is a great opening. What happens next is going to be really interesting. And then we can hopefully come back here and have a conversation. We got that? Okay. On that note, I turn it back. Please give a round of applause to Infaniso and Lois for this really robust discussion.